In the United States National Park System alone, there are more than 84 million acres of preserved woods, deserts, mountains, and wilderness. So it's no surprise that in the past 100 years, there have been a number of cases of hikers going missing. Many of those who vanished were young children and inexperienced hikers, but some were healthy and seasoned outdoors people. That there is more to these disappearances than just kids wandering off or hikers becoming disoriented. What could cause someone to seemingly vanish into thin air? There are two approaches people take to explaining these mysterious disappearances, earthly and supernatural. The National Park Service does not collect data on how many visitors disappear within the vast expanses. I would think that they should. I would think that this would be something that would be of interest to their visitors and to data of missing persons. Indeed, most people turn up on their own within a few days. However, there have been an estimated 1,600 unexplained disappearances in North America. Uh, dehydration or just becoming confused, um, scared, fear, maybe adrenaline. But they find these people's clothing, a six miles away from where they went missing. They find them six or eight miles or 20 from where they went missing. Uh, the the one story about the young man who was skiing and, and had all the equipment, had two sources of backup phone uh, batteries, had signal on his phone, had sent messages, had tried to send messages, uh, or people had tried to send him messages and the messages came through but he had not tried to send any out, and they found him, you know. It was like, what was what was the reason why he didn't answer his messages? What was the reason why he ended up in these rocks up on this mountaintop? Um, so, but there have definitely been some mysterious disappearances in the United States and abroad. Federal government-run national parks, federal government as well as in related spaces such as national forests, state parks, and more. Here are some of the most fascinating to date. I think you would be surprised to learn that Dennis Martin is only number eight. I would have really thought Dennis Martin would have been up there, like really up there. Gabby Petito is on here was this before she was uh, murdered and they were just searching for her? Her her disappearance has no link here. I don't even think her name should be listed here. She was a murder victim of a boyfriend. Um, they were in the National Park, but it was not because she went missing. He murdered her and hit her body, and later she was discovered and, you know... It has no link here. I don't even think it should be included. I'm going to eliminate the ones like that. So here is Bessie and Glenn Hyde from 1928. Bessie and Glenn Hyde were honeymooning in northern Arizona at the Grand Canyon when they vanished. They were traveling down the Colorado River by, by boat. I guess like little chuggy, what are they called? Like the little rowboats in 1928 and planned to boat through the Grand Canyon. Bessie would have been the first woman to ever do so. Maybe somebody didn't want her to be the first woman to ever do so. <laughs> Glenn had run tough rivers before, but Bessie was new to boating. The couple ran across other boaters a few weeks before their disappearance who said they got the feeling that Bessie did not really want to go but that Glenn was pushing her onward. If they completed the trip, they could go on a paid tour. Okay, cut to several months later, the Hyde's boat was discovered that winter seemingly undisturbed. It was upright and full of their supplies, but the couple was nowhere to be found. There are many theories about what happened to the Hyde's. Did they leave the boat to disembark on a hike? Did they have an argument that turned violent? Were they abducted? 
There are conflicting reports about what happened to the hides and more than one Bessie hide sighting in the years that followed. Okay, Alfred Bell Hart's 1938. Four-year-old Alfred Bell Hartz was the first recorded drowning in Colorado's Rocky Mountain National Park. Though whether Bell Hartz actually drowned is controversial. He was camping in the park with his family over the 4th of July weekend when he disappeared near the Roaring and Fall Rivers. Bell Hartz, I don't know if I'm saying the name right, had gone with his dad to ba to bathe in the river, and from there they decided, he decided to join two family friends about 500 feet upstream. Uh, when everyone returned to camp, they realized the child was missing. A search began immediately, expanding to 100 civilian conservation corps members within 45 minutes but there was never a sighting there was any there was barely any signs of him anywhere a day after he disappeared a couple hiking about six miles away reported seeing a boy who looked like him sitting in an area called the devil's nest remember what this david guy says about how mo uh, many of these sighting of these missing disappearances are around names to do with the devil <laughs> i mean i'm just saying you know by the time authorities arrived the, arrived the boy was gone so these people are out there they see a four-year-old child sitting alone in a camping area they just go off and leave him hey let's just go on our way you know, don't worry about him though everybody in the country is looking for this kid of course, they may not have known that because they're out in the woods like that, out in the wilderness. They didn't have cell phones back then, you know. So, by the time authorities arrived, he was gone. The search went on for 10 days, including 150 searchers plus bloodhounds. Though the size of the search party dwindled by a dozen by the end of the eighth day, park rangers chalked up his disappearance to drowning. drowning. Well... I don't know about that. Let's go on to the next one. Catherine Van Alst. Or Alst. Catherine Van Alst. 1946. Now, is this the one where they found the little girl and she was like in the... Yeah, this is it. Eight year, there was rumors, there was speculation that this case was one of a... was created by family members of this girl to get attention and gifts and money and a, and get their name in the paper and all. I don't know. I read some, like, stories about that, about how they, th there were people who were very, um, who just really had this suspicion around the parents, around the dad, and... There was even some people who didn't even believe that this was an actual child. There was one story that I read, very bizarre, and I don't know if it was on Reddit or where. I would have to go back and search and search for it. But they said that when the child was found and the pictures were taken, that some people believed that this was a midget. <laughs> I don't even know. But they said they believed it was made up just to get attention. Now, I don't know. I'm sure some people out there would know whether this child actually existed. But anyway, eight-year-old Catherine Van Alst disappeared from Devil's Den State Park near Arkansas's Ozark National Forest, where she and her family were camping. Van Alst apparently was playing with her brothers when she wandered off and got lost and couldn't find her way back. What makes her disappearance remarkable is that she was found six days later. Well, they say here that she was found wandering in the woods, but in the other story that I read, and maybe it was on the YouTube video, was that she was in a cave, and when they were calling out to her, um, she just came out. Like, here I am. And so I don't know. She was eerily calm. 
University of Arkansas student Porter Chadwick was part of the search party that found her. He told the press that when he found her, she walked stoically out of a cave and just said, Here I am. See what I said? She had survived on buries and spent nights uh, sleeping in the caves. Many other hikers have gotten lost in that part of the Ozarks and have not been as lucky. Now, they don't go into any more detail right here, but the stories was is that she told them that the first night she slipped on soft grass, or she described it as like a soft, um, the way that the people, the adults around took it was like she was describing like some kind of a bed made out of hay or straw or something on the in the woods and that she ate berries and she also said that at times she could hear the people calling out to her searching for her and that when she would call out to them it was like they didn't hear her and so that's one reason why some people were like was this real or was this some kind of farce or I don't know um the story doesn't go into detail here but in the other story she was swimming in a like a little creek area that was like for the campers there and she went over into a deeper area and another woman that was there with her kids kind of come over to her and told her you know this area is a little bit too deep you might want to go back over where you're or the other kids are playing, don't go into the deeper water. And um, her father was there, and that he saw her talking to this woman. And later, when he, you know, when the child disappeared, he asked the woman, and she told her that she had just warned her about the water being too deep, and told her that she should go back over with the other kids. The father said that he saw her turn away from this woman and come back over to where the other children were. And when he looked back again, she was gone. So I don't know. Um, there's an area in Green Mountain National Forest. Okay, let's go back. This is the next story. Paul Weldon, also from 1946. There's an area in Green Mountain National Forest near Glad Glast Glastonbury Mountain and Vermont's Long Trail that believers in the paranormal call Bennington Triangle. The area got its name, got this name because of a handful of mysterious disappearances which occurred between 1945 and 1950. Although many more have been recorded over the years, paranormal author Joseph Citro coined the term because of the supernatural circumstances surrounding these vanishings. Paulo Weldon was the second person to go missing in that area during this period. 18-year-old Weldon was a college student who set out on the long trail in December 1946. She was dressed for walking and not for a long hike, wearing jeans, a coat, and sneakers. She told her roommate that she was going for a walk and she never returned home, returned back. Several people spotted her as she hitchhiked her way to the trail and walked to the trailhead. When Weldon didn't come back by dark, her roommate left the school and let let the school know, and the search began. Classes were suspended so that students could help in the search. The process was disorganized at first until her father called in favors with surrounding police. Unfortunately, the search panned out nothing, and frustrated family and friends had their own theories. Did Weldon run off with a boyfriend? Was she abducted? Did she commit suicide or did she die from exposure? No one has ever discovered her body, so her disappearance remains a mystery. There's a rumor from this area of the Long Trail is home to a creature called the Bennington Monster. Could this Sasquatch-like animal have something to do with her disappearance? I don't think so. Poor, poor old Sasquatch and Bigfoot, they get blamed so much for these people disappearing and 
Uh, I just, <laughs> um, I've often wondered if some of these people didn't just fall into crevices. Like in these national parks, you have and you have a lot of rocks, and there's the story about this one guy. It's a they made a movie out of it. I think it's called 127 Hours. I think James. I think I think it's James Franco. Plays this guy who's like a he's he's an avid outdoors person, and he's in one of these national park areas, and he falls down in between the crevices of these rocks and gets his arm caught. And nothing that he does, no no amount of struggle or anything, he cannot free himself. And he ends up having to cut, this is the story, he ends up having to cut away his flesh and stuff to free himself. Because after he's been out there for so long, he starts to become dehydrated and... He knows the only way he's going to get out of there and free himself is to cut himself away. That's what he ends up having to do. So, her, there, there was never any spotting of her, and, you know, I don't know about the other people. I'm going to look that story up and see who these other people were and what the circumstances were. Okay, so Larry Jeffrey, 1966. Six-year-old Larry Jeffrey disappeared near the peak of the 1,200-foot Mount Charleston Humboldt National Forest, which is just a short drive from Las Vegas, Nevada. The search began immediately after the boy wandered away from his family, and within days the National Guard and a team of bloodhounds had come out to search. In a TV interview, David Pilatus told reporter that there was no predators afoot that day, and since the area they were in was pretty secluded, it was easy to rule out abduction by car. This boy just walked into oblivion, he says. When Jeffrey disappeared, he was wearing light clothing, and authorities were doubtful that he could have survived the cold temperatures at night. Searchers found and lost the trail a few times, and they discovered evidence that the boy had been eating insects. How do they know that? If they never found him? And forage for berries along the way. Overall, a thousand people searched for 16 days, but they never found him. Okay, here's our case. Six-year-old Dennis Martin was on a camping trip near the Tennessee-North Carolina state line in the Smoky Mountains National Park. With his family in the summer of 1969, it was an annual Father's Day tradition. All of the men in the family would head to the Smoky Mountains to camp and hike. Dennis and his brothers had been... Well, Dennis and his brothers, but there were other children there too, if I remember the story, was that another family was there... And they had some young boys, and they were also in on the prank. Dennis and his brothers had planned to prank on the adults by jumping out on them, like, boo, you know. They were going to hide separately in the bush and jump out on different sides of the campsite to scare the adults. It was a practical joke that should have ended with some startled shouts and laughter, but the laughter quickly ended when they realized that Dennis was nowhere to be found. Family, park rangers, and other hikers spread out to search for Dennis almost immediately. But he was nowhere to be found. That evening, there was a very heavy rainfall. And if I remember right, it was like it flooded. They, I think they said that it flooded so much overnight, uh, more so than they had ever recorded, you know. That was very very strange. The search for Martin became the largest in National Park history. One of the people searching for him was park ranger Dwight McCarter, who had successfully tracked down hundreds of missing persons. He was a seasoned tracker, and he was struck by the complete lack of any sorts of tracks. Well, it poured rain, I mean like heavy deluge downpour. For anybody that's ever been in the Smoky Mountains, it's noisy there all the time anyway because of the water. There's there's um, 
it's like echoes. You're down, if you're down in, I don't know, I think they were near the Cades Cove area. This was before the park was really, I mean, the National Park, inside the National Park is not developed like Gatlinburg and all that. There are some camping areas that do have like public bathrooms and there are a few buildings around where you can stop and do, do like tour, you know, like campsites and stuff, picnic areas, but it's very noisy because of the crash and the water, just constant. There are waterfalls all around, uh, traffic, which at that time, like I said, there probably wasn't a lot of traffic, but unless you're out in the woods, and if it had poured rain, like they said, it's going to wash away any evidence, you know, any and this was a very disorganized search. They said that this case was one reason why they began the searches in the search grids like they do now. And uh, because so many people just came in and just started trampling all over everything, searching, uh, trampling all, like the Boy Scouts, the National Guard, the local people in the area wanted to come and help. And everybody was just tracking around every which way. It was very disorganized, and they didn't know what areas had been searched and what areas hadn't. So they said that this case is one of the reasons why they began this new system of searching. So I guess that did lead to one good thing, because it, you know, um, Dennis seemed to have disappeared completely, leaving no trace. His disappearance today is still a mystery. One possible lead that searchers didn't follow as a report came from another family that evening that the boy went missing. The Key family allegedly heard a scream and then saw a bear man, give me a break, with something slung over its shoulder. It looked like it could be a small child. It could have been a bear, an actual bear, because there are, the Smoky Mountains are filled with black bears, and in the 1969, the population was probably greater than it is today. So it could have been a bear. It could have been dragging the kid, you know, but I don't think it was a bear man. <laughs> I've been to the Smoky Mountains quite a few times, and I've seen some characters there, but I've never seen a bear man. I've actually seen some bears, but never a bear man. Or not a bar man. <laughs> uh, I'm, I, I shouldn't be laughing, but you know stuff like that. It's like, it's like they want to create this supernatural or just Bigfoot, you know, and they want to bring in all these searchers. So let's go look for Bigfoot. So the story becomes about looking for Bigfoot or looking for bar man instead of looking for this child. They didn't follow this lead because I don't think I would have either. I mean, I probably would have said, well, let's go search the area in case that bear got the kid. Or maybe it was an actual man. Maybe it was just some big, gruff, rough-looking, hairy man, you know. I don't know. We'll never know whether this was related to his disappearance. But one thing did come out of this. That so many volunteers will destroy clues. Nowadays, searches involve less people, and they have more training, and they do it in a constructed way. They they know who how many people are in a search party and what area they're going to. They give them a grid, and they have a guide with them that t tells them don't don't stray over this way too far, you know. So, um, Dennis's family, the last that I read about, they lived in Knoxville, Tennessee, which is probably an hour or so from the Smoky Mountains, and they never gave up searching. They said that the grandfather of this child was out there. He, he stayed behind. The dad and the grandfather stayed behind for a long time until they was just nobody left to search and that the grandfather would go back there every year every year that he would go back and he would ask around and ask questions and 
It was just something that they never got over. I don't know if his mother and father are both still living or not, but the Smoky Mountains, I mean, I'm sure these other parks are very vast as well, but the Smoky Mountains is like, and, and keep in mind, this was 69, what, 50 years, 52 years ago, 53 years ago. Um, pine trees and undeveloped forest for miles and miles and miles. And um, campsites and stuff, yeah, but just the terrain for a small child. My guess was always that when the rain came, he might have the mud, he may have slipped and fallen into a creek and it got washed away. But surely there would have been some sign of a t-shirt or something. I think they did. I, I don't know if the, if I read right. I would have to go back and look. But they did find a footprint near the riverbank. But they just kind of brushed it away. Because they thought it belonged to a, a Boy Scout. But now Boy Scouts that are out there searching are typically going to be about 12, 13, 14. They're not going to be 6, you know. And that smile of a footprint. Douglas Legg, 1971. Douglas Legg and some of his family were heading out for a hike in the Adirondacks in the National Preserve, in Tanoni Preserve. I guess this was in New York, the Adirondacks. His uncle spotted some poison ivy and told him to put on his long paints to protect his legs. The family's cabin was only a straight shot from where the eight-year-old, from where the grandfather was waiting for the eight-year-old, but the child never returned. Unlike a lot of kids who have gone missing, Leg was very familiar with these woods. His family owned the cabin where they were staying and described him as a mini woodsman because they were often out there hiking. Legs' disappearance sparked one, of the, sparked one of the Southern Adirondacks' largest search and rescue missions. They had more than 600 people searching the woods, just like Dennis Martin. However, there was no trace of him anywhere. Unlike in the Martin case, though, rescuers used dogs in this search. They didn't use dogs in the Martin case because of the rain had it started raining that night, and it rained all night. They said it was a very heavy, just like downpour. They they brought helicopters in, and it started to rain again the next day when they went to search, and the helicopters were of no use, so they just couldn't go up, you know. Um, some accounts describe the dogs that fo had followed the scent for 30 miles through some rough, difficult terrain. How a child could have traveled alone for such a long distance. Some searchers reported seeing bear-like tracks near the site. While black bears do drag prey off, dragging a child 30 miles over rough terrain seems unusual for a bear. Even like in the Dennis Martin case, if it had been a bear, there would have been traces of his clothing, blood, and bars, bars will attack you and eat and eat at your flesh, but they're not going to eat your shirt and your shoes and everything else. And most bars attack under like um, the fence. If if given the opportunity, if you walked upon a black bar in your front yard, it more than likely is going to like scare you. To show its dominance, and then it's going to take the heck off if it can. Most of them don't attack. Now they might if they are scared enough. And I'm a black bear expert, so I should know. And I'm really not. I'm just saying, this is. It's very. It would be very. It wouldn't be unusual to be attacked by a black bear, but would the grandfather who was standing? What did they say? Uh, not, not. It doesn't say how far, but he was very close to the cabin. Would he not heard the child scream? 
Now, in the Dennis Martin case, maybe not because of the wind and everything down in the Smoky Mountains and the noise from the creeks roaring and stuff, but I don't think that the grandfather would not have heard this child scream. Was the grandfather ever looked at as maybe possibly having made this whole thing up? I don't know. The family became desperate and began searching well, here I go. Here, just what I got done saying. The family began to suspect each other, and even some of their friends suggested that the child may have been a victim of foul play. I don't know. All this stuff that I say as a side note on these videos is just my personal opinion about it and my thoughts and what I think. Okay, I'm going to add my own thoughts, but it's not necessarily anything factual you know what I mean I mean there really may be a Bigfoot man out there I don't know Olympic National Park Olympic National Park in northern Washington state has a feature that's not as majestic as its mountain views at least four hikers have mysteriously disappeared from the area in the past 25 years one of whom was 73-year-old John Devine. In 1997, Devine planned to hike into the park from Mount Baldy. The trail is a tough 24 miles, and though Devine was elderly, he was also an experienced hiker and a long-distance hiker. Devine was camping with his friend Greg Balzer, they split up on the day that Devine went missing. Balzer went off to hunt while Devine took off on a day hike. He never returned. Yeah, I'm already starting to get vibes about that story. The fruitless search for Devine lasted a full week until a rescue helicopter crash killed three people and injured five others. By that time, weather conditions had deteriorated, making the chances of finding divine slim friends and family said that he wouldn't want to put people in danger and the search was called off the search helicopter's crash is as mysterious as divine's disappearance before takeoff the pilot used a hand signal indicating that he was going to wait five minutes for conditions to improve before attempting it a few moments later, the helicopter departed vertically without warning and crashed into the side of the mountain. Well, so this brings me to number five, and I'm going to stop the video right here and come back and do part two, because I'm already almost into 40 minutes into my video. So I will divide this up, and thank you all for watching, and thank you all for listening to my theories, which are just theories.